there. Beautiful colors, and the wind picks up, and causes the white caps in about five, three to five minutes. And it turns perfectly calm about 20 minutes later. And then as the sun set, it turned to glass again. We went and had a campfire, and we come back to the lake, and you look at the stars, you see two to three times as many stars as you see here because you're at 8,000 feet elevation. There is no light pollution. And when you look at the lake, you can see the stars reflect off the lake. And I thought to myself, tell me there's a God. The young man that was with us says, how can people say they're not God? I thought, amen. And that was a glorious morning. We also got within about 30 yards of the bones later that day. So I'm going to read Psalm 8. O Lord, O Lord, how much excellent is your name in all the earth. You have sacred glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength. Because of your enemies, that you may silence the enemy of the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him? and the Son of Man, that you visit him. For you have made him a little more than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of, it, of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all the sheep and the oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, and paths through, and that pass through the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Two other things that come to mind is this young man said, doesn't this nature make you feel small? And when you read and hear Psalm 8, that God's entrusted us to care for his creation. Fishing in a lake, fishing for trout, who watch the trout 30 or 40 feet away come and hit your door. Something, I know you, some of you men have experienced in Canada before, but it was a great week uh, for Carter and I and the friend that went with us. So, Maybe your week wasn't that exciting, so we're glad you're here to worship our great God. And uh, welcome to today's service. If you're a visitor, we'd love to have you go online and fill out our visitor card. Uh, today we have a Sunday School Hour. We'll give a short presentation on the Adams family, who is our missionary of the month. And then we also have a quarterly business meeting uh, during today's Sunday School Hour. Uh, tonight, small groups at various locations. Uh, you can check with Matt Rogge uh, for small group times and locations. Also, youth group tonight at 6 o'clock. If you need a ride, please contact Mike. Uh, next Sunday, we have uh, the Plink family here to give a missionary update. If you recall, I think when we started the Missionary of the Month back in February, they were our first Missionary of the Month, so we get to see them and have an update from the Plinks. Also, stepping back, uh, during the Sunday school hour, Pastor had a conversation with uh, the Mickish family yesterday, so he's going to give it a short update on the Mickish family as well. As we look forward, uh, August 8th and August 9th, Saturday and Sunday, we have Tom Meyer. If you don't recall who Tom Meyer is, he's uh, a public scholar. He has memorized books of the Bible. Uh, so he's going to give a presentation on Saturday uh, sometime. The time is not set exactly yet, but on the Holy Land. And then he'll be presenting uh, in the Sunday morning as well. And we're looking for someone to host a meal for he and his family on Saturday evening, August 8th. So please talk to Pastor if you are interested in hosting Tom Meyer and his family uh, for that. That's all I have. We'll have to invite Paul up for this morning's first song.
spoken in prayer. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity we have together this morning to worship. Thank you that you have filled your creation with so many beautiful things designed to show us how small we are, how big you are, and how much joy you want to give us. I pray that having seen your goodness in your general revelation through creation, that we would be eager to find your will in your word, which is the only thing that can give us specific directions on how to live. I pray that your word would define and boundary and give us safety and joy and peace in our lives as we obey it. I pray that it would inform our worship and I pray that it would be the foundation of our character. I pray that you would encourage the people who would normally be able to be here at church this morning but perhaps can't because of health or travel or other responsibilities. Please encourage them in their place to give them safety and healing and a swift return to fellowship with us. I pray that you help all of us connected to this church as we exist in a community. And this community, whether it is our local community or our national community, has long been pursuing a course of disobedience to you, doing things that you hate to our own destruction. I pray that you would Help us as your lights in this community to shine brightly with the love of Christ and with a shameless adherence to the truth. I pray that you give our leaders from the local to the national level wisdom and selflessness in the decisions that they make. And even as you have promised that the heart of the king is in your hand and that you turn his direction wherever you want. I pray that we would have faith that though our nation often does things that you hate, still you are sovereign and you are able to turn all kinds of evil into great good. I pray that you would bless our troops in their various places of duty. I think specifically of Salah and Saki as they are off to boot camp this week. I pray that you give them safety in their missions. I pray that you'd also so bless our public servants and give the Christians among these folks a special testimony so they can get a hearing for the gospel. As we continue to worship you this morning, Father, please help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name I pray.
Ecclesiastes chapter 7. We're looking at verses 5 through 7 again this morning. Last week we took a whole morning message to look at one verse. Hopefully we get through the other two this morning. It's an important set of verses. It stands out in the book of Ecclesiastes as a place where Solomon begins to make some application. Solomon, Solomon the author of the book of Ecclesiastes, is essentially writing an essay. And this essay is designed as a persuasive book to encourage people to make a choice. And he presents that choice as two options, door number one, door number two. Your door number one, which is the door through which most people walk, you've got living under the sun. And what he means by living under the sun is that most of the time when we think about our lives, we think of it only within the realm of this earth. We don't think of our lives as being in a context of God's glorious eternal plan. And so when we are dealing with our lives, we're making decisions without God in mind. That's door number one. And it's really easy to be walking through that door all the time. Even for those of us who have accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior, our reflex is to live merely under the sun. And when we make decisions about what we're going to be doing today, we're not thinking in terms of, of God. Now, the other door is the door that Solomon is arguing for in this essay of his, and that door is the fear of the Lord. And throughout the book, he's been describing for us so far what the fear of the Lord looks like in comparison to living under the sun. And he's been doing that mostly through a negative expose of all the things that this life has for us to enjoy. And he's talked about the party life, and he's talked about the hardworking life, and he's talked about all different kinds of things. And he's saying if we do these things merely under the sun, then our lives are going to be full of frustration. And the phrase that he uses over and over again is vanity and vexation of spirit. That could be translated emptiness and wind chasing. Nobody here has ever caught the wind. Maybe you caught the leaf that the wind was blowing, but most of the time you don't even catch that, do you? And so when we try to pursue a life of fulfillment, and we, we leave God out of that equation, when we're living only under the sun without God as the central part of our lives, it's like chasing the wind. It's something that we can never catch. Our lives will be full of only emptiness and wind chasing. All through chapters 1 through 6, Solomon has been making this point. Now in chapter 7, he kind of departs from the, me the measured progress of this argument to give us a whole bunch of examples. And he does this through four surprising statements. And we're looking at the second of those surprising statements this morning. And this series of messages is based around a question. And that question is, what is good for me? And in the first four verses... Solomon compares sorrow and happiness, or sorrow and laughter. And he says in the first four verses that sorrow is better for me. Now, in the passage that we looked at last week, the question is, what is good for me? And that, the answer to that question is rebuke. So let's read the passage here and kind of see what Solomon's saying, and then we'll talk a brief review through what we, what we looked at last week before we get into verses 6 and 7. Solomon says in verses 5, 6, and 7, It is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. For like the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fool. This also is vanity. Surely oppression destroys a wise man's reason, and a bribe debases the heart. Let's pray and ask the Lord to bless our understanding in the word this morning. Thank you, Father. That even as you are alive and powerful, your word is alive and powerful. I pray that as you have told us that your word is like a sharp two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart, that your word would lay us open this morning and help us to see what we really are. And as we see what we really are, I pray that we would have a very complete picture of Christ in our minds. And that we'd be able to make a comparison. And through that comparison, I pray that we would be conformed to his image. For through this, I know that we can have joy and peace. Through this, indeed, is the fear of the Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So first of all, in verse 5, Solomon makes a surprising statement. And I hope that it is surprising to us. The surprising statement is that it's 
better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. Now, not too many of us go out of our way to put ourselves under the rebuke of any person. Rebuke is a hard thing to hear. Rebuke is confrontation. Rebuke is being told, no, you're wrong. You shouldn't have done that. You should have done this instead. Rebuke is not an easy thing for most of us to interact with. And we can understand this because most of us, when we are rebuked, tend to respond in a defensive way. And one of the things that I challenged us to do last week is when we are rebuked, whether the rebuke seems to be coming from a wise source or even if it's coming from an unwelcome source that we don't trust, that we actually perhaps even judge as foolish, that we respond to that rebuke with a pause, that we don't immediately allow ourselves to become defensive, but rather instead that we pause and wait and consider whether or not that rebuke is consistent with God's word. Because the, the, the idea that Solomon is communicating here is not that every rebuke is correct. He says the rebuke of the wise. But because of our reflex, or at least because of my reflex, when I am confronted with rebuke, I tend to get defensive. And I don't want to hear it. Or I want to argue with it. And that's how I dare say, 